The grace and peace of Christ be with you, friends. And thank you for taking some time to gather with us for worship from wherever you are, whenever you are. Today's message is given at St. James's United Reformed Church in the heart of Newcastle upon Tyne on Palm Sunday, the 2nd of April, 2023, the start of Holy Week. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Entering Jerusalem should have been like entering home. As a child, Jesus went missing for three days when his family had paid their pilgrimage to the temple. When they found him, he was surrounded by astonished wizened old men who declared his wisdom. He admonished his parents, who were both overjoyed at finding him as well as deeply frustrated, saying, Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Jerusalem had been the footstool of God. It was the place where the covenant was renewed time and again. Jesus going there was supposed to be like a child returning home and finding her bedroom still intact, the heart-throb teenage band posters still on the wall, a familial feel of a time long since gone by, but kept as a refuge from the loud, clanging, and demanding world full of slurs and inhuman expectations. The reality is, of course, that few of us ever get to go back home. Our bedrooms, if we have them, disappear almost as quickly as we leave them converted to other purposes, or abandoned as those who raise us, downsize, or other siblings take over. The refuge of nostalgia is gone. Jesus knows Jerusalem is no longer the home he could once curl up in and teach of God as if at home in his father's house. After this palm-waving entry, Jesus decries the city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jerusalem has become as if a foreign country to him, and it has changed in his lifetime. As a young boy, Rome conquered Judea. The people of Judea have grown hostile to one another and polarized, Prophets roam from town to town, gathering large crowds and whipping people into frenzies. Some, like the Pharisees, try to maintain order and discipline against the double onslaught of the Romans and the rabble-rousing preachers by rigidly enforcing rules and ostracizing those who stray from them. Others, as with the tax collectors, accept as given domination by the Romans and collude in stripping hard-earned wages of taxes destined for a corrupt monarch in name only and the conquering empire. Jerusalem has not continued as a place where the voice of a child could be heard teaching in the temple. It has become a pit of collusion and death, of polarization, pain, and busy manipulation, yet trying somehow under all of that to maintain its holy character. Where, in such a place, could God be found? Jesus enters this now foreign-feeling place and declares that he has longed to act as that mother hen which gathers people under its wings and protects them from the hate oppression, poverty, fear, and anxiety around them, bringing them to an encounter with God. But he cannot even enter the temple to teach. The temple has become filled with money changers charging exorbitant fees for people to exchange their hard-won earnings in a depressed economy for the right and apparently acceptable offerings to God. Jesus knows this is not asked of by God. He remembers it as a place to teach, to hear and be heard, to be recognized by God, (sighs) memory is strong. Remembering how something should be and comparing it to how it is now and finding the current manifestation deficient is the source of grief. And grief is the root of anger. 
Jesus got angry. Seeing the state of the temple, he turned the tables, flipping them over and chasing people with a whip. It wasn't a hot rage either. Scripture described him sitting down and making a whip of cords, something that would have taken time and patient attention. And then he waited for the officials to come, arrest and crucify him. Perhaps God could save Jerusalem, the people, the world. We have memories, even those of us who are counted as young, of a time when voices of faith could be heard and taken seriously, counted as part of normality, a place where community and love converged. Now, though, we may feel much diminished. We may struggle to fill our weekly worship leadership rotas, and this may make us angry. It may make us feel as if we should storm the center of where civic society is and chase people with whips and turn over tables to remind them of what is good and equitable, just and holy. This is what love looks like. And in the name of expediency, that might just feel good, but hmm, just for a while. It won't take us home. It won't restore what needs to happen. And it likely will get us crucified. Jesus didn't ask us to go and get ourselves crucified. Jesus did that already. So what are we to do? Stanley Hauerwas, a theologian, likes to suggest that Christians should live as resident aliens in the place they inhabit. As Christians, we bear in our communal character a unique quality centered not on our own action, but on God's grace. We don't have to We don't presume to have earned that grace. Instead, in humility, we recognize that God is faithful to us and we, in gratitude to a God who loves us, live humbly via faith, hope, and love. We cannot make, through sheer force of will, the world as it is into the world as it should be. We know that the world as it is is isolating. The world out there, not unlike the world Jesus entered with Crowds waving palms at him and shouting Hosanna, the same crowd that would shout crucify him days later, is isolating. Hosanna has turned from a cry of acclamation to a plea for help. I imagine you could hear the desperation just beneath the supposed celebration. As they were then, so many are now. People are alone. People are thrown to the economic wolves. People are breathing moldy air in substandard housing. People are battling to have enough to eat. People in good jobs are lonely. The West End Food Bank, the largest in the country, runs out of food almost every day now. Across this city, this city, 42.4% of children live in poverty. Now, as a church, it's not our primary job to provide the band-aid to fix these things though at times we will feel called to do so. It is our job to remind people of the grace of God that affirms humanity, the common good that binds us all. It is our job as modern-day disciples to live lives that refuse to collapse into selfish desires that allow us to turn a blind eye to the suffering people of God. Filled with grace, we are salt and light, small elements of a recipe that profoundly changes the entire construction of our community. As a church, we do that in two ways, worship and recognition. First, we offer worship to God. Every time we walk out of here on a Sunday or out of church or wherever it is that we're worshiping, we should feel like disciples following Jesus into a much changed Jerusalem. As Christian people, we will always be resident aliens because we know that God, and not kings, emperors, corporations, money, landlords, influencers, or stock market manipulators, is ruler of the earth. And therefore, what we do here, and worship to such a God, will seem foreign to the world. Our buildings even look different to capture this, and no matter how much an old church is turned into another type of space, It can never escape its roots as a place of citizenship in an entirely different kingdom. What happens in a church is an encounter with something wholly other, a God who is God who is not distant, but at hand. 
Second, though, is that through worship and encounter, we affirm the beauty, the meaning of human life together with no other expectation than nothing to buy. Our society doesn't do this. As resident aliens, we, teach the peop- we treat the people we encounter out in the wider world as people who bear the image of God. We recognize one another and our abiding humanity as Jesus did with people too. People ache to be recognized, to be seen, and to know they are seen. In worship, in coffee hour, in the phone calls that we make to check in on each other, in meetings, in emails, in hospital visits, in practicing holy curiosity, never gossip. We act on recognition and affirm a love more deep than any personal dislikes or hate. Both of these counter the communal and individual isolation that sits as the empty heart beating at our societal busyness, polarization, hate, and inertia, a society that defines you by your age, position, buying power, or credit rating. In encountering God, our eyes get lifted to see as God sees, our ears get open to hear as God hears, our mouths get inspired to speak as God speaks. It never stays. We have to keep returning to God in order to return to ourselves. But God's faithfulness continues. That is the weekly, if not more frequent, task of this church, to offer worship that provides encounter and recognition. This is not fast work. It takes time, patience, and a remembering that in the face of each person you meet, whether here or in the world, you may be encountering the face of Christ. Now I hear us worry that we are so different from what is around us. But if we are focused on God, then of course we are different. We are resident aliens, and if exiting from this place is akin to following Jesus in Jerusalem, then entering it surely is akin to entering a foreign country too. If what we are offering is truly a response to God's faithfulness to us, in relationship with the people to whom we minister as resident aliens, then it will always be different. The real question is not on its difference. We should celebrate that. But whether it is a place where people encounter God's grace and love through our stewardship. Sisters and brothers, wave those palms. The crowds are crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest is a plea to God for help, to be seen, a cry from an isolated people to God. Jesus got atop that borrowed cult and he entered the city. He threw his faith on God to be with him in an encounter that could transform a city that had become so lost that it was no longer God's footstool, but a place of death and pain. What he did has changed not only that place, but the world. In love. He brought us to be with him. Thanks be to God that we continue on that journey with him today. Perhaps the Hosanna can change to a plea of joy. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. The grace and peace of God be with you.